Larson's um, speaking, he's visiting here a whole week. So um, I think we're probably having a dinner afterwards, actually, so you can come and talk to me if you're interested in that. And um, anyway, with that, uh, take it away. Thanks, and thanks for hospitality. Um, I'm here the whole week, and I'm very eager to uh, talk to people, to hear what uh, they're doing, and um, learn physics. I like physics, so it's good to learn from people that are still getting used to this whole post-COVID thing of actually talking to people. It's lovely. So at any rate, um, I'm going to give this uh, talk in a little bit of a soft mode, so I will uh, perhaps under, uh, hopefully not under aim too much, but I have sort of just one, two simple points I want to get across. So let me start just with introducing black hole thermodynamics for people who don't live and breathe this. Black holes are thermal objects. It's exciting in part because uh, low energy physics describes thermodynamics of large black holes reliably. That way we get some window into quantum gravity. One of the things we learn is that we could compute the entropy thermodynamic entropy, the sense of black hole entropy. And it tells us that quantum black holes are made out of many constituents. And that's exciting. And uh, we could try to go and look for those. The uh, one of the ways to try to uh, exploit this dependence uh, of uh, this window into uh, quantum gravity is to do a sort of a theoretical experiment, obviously contradiction. But one of the things we can do is to uh, find black hole solutions just using ordinary uh, general relativity. And then uh, from those solutions, we can compute the area and determine what the entropy is. And we can think about that as data. Once we compute the area, we find interesting formulae like this. Um, this is just the formula for Kerr Newman uh, black holes. I'm told Paris uh, teaching a course in advanced GR. Hopefully, a few of you were sufficiently uh, uneducated that you still benefit from that sort of thing. So uh, this might be the sort of thing that it turns up in a class like that. Is the area of a black hole. And what one is supposed to see is that it depends on the mass and it depends on the charge and depends on the angle momentum in some way that's sort of slightly non-trivial but not terribly complicated. One of the things you want to pay attention to is that there's even some phase structure here. There's a square root. It means that you probably want to make sure these parameters in here are such that the square root uh, can be taken, that they're positive, um, and that'll play an important role that uh, we should make sure that the uh, mass, the energy, is large enough that we can take such a square root. Now, from the other side that I will talk barely anything about in this talk is that by holography, quantum constituents are not gravitational. So the actual sort of interior we somehow think about is not gravitational by holography. They form a more ordinary quantum system without gravity that has lower dimensionality. And the standard paradigm for this is quantum gravity medius five, that's dual to any four super yard mills, four dimensions, so a CFT. And in the excited states in that quantum field theory is identified with the black hole microstates. I'm saying this just in terms of situating what I'm going to talk about, because what I'm talking about is nearly entirely on the gravity side. But one of the motivations for trying to understand the gravity side is that when you learn something interesting, you can say that you have learned something about the phase diagram of the dual CFT, and you might have learned something that was surprising. So things should be seen in that aspect. But uh, I think you might find that some of the things I'll tell you are plenty surprising, even just as some gravitational stuff. So my strategy, and the strategy that's very common, is to think about ground states. It's very reasonable. If you have a quantum system, you're trying to learn about it this kind of experimental sense I'm talking about, and just saying, oh, let's try to look at the formulae. What should we look for in a complicated looking formula like that? Well, let's look at ground states. That's the lowest energy for given quantum numbers. So if you have quantum numbers like charge and angular momentum or whatever else that's conserved, go to the lowest possible energy that you can find. And that's the extremal black holes. And you might want to think about them as ground states. It's the lowest energy in some kind of super selection sector. So it's the ground state of the theory. Now, it turns out that there are different ways to think about that. And I think it's come, at least to me, a bit, uh, become a little clearer in the last few years that, that really there's a contradictory kind of way in which people are thinking about things here. Uh, one claim that's generally accepted is that, well, ground states are nice, especially if they are supersymmetric, because uh, the supersymmetric black holes we can do a really good job on. Uh, 
In fact, in some cases, favorable cases, we can do an exact gravitational description in the sense that we can find not merely the entropy, but really the degeneracy in the sense of an exact number, an integer. And that integer agrees asymptotically for large charges with the kind of entropy formula we get from gravity. But this is the kind of thing that persuades people and makes them say that we understand it really, really, really well. We've understood black hole entropy. Don't even ask more questions. We have understood it all, which is not always lie. But still, um, it's uh, the sort of thing that leads you to think that we have understood awfully much. And it's based on the idea of ground states. And specifically, it's uh, based on the idea of uh, these supersymmetric ground states. Because there's another claim that uh, has been repeated over decades, actually, but especially recently, that, uh, well, if you take an extreme black hole, and if you read very carefully the footnotes of papers or talks, people will say, oh, I do think I said generic, didn't I? But anyway, they just say all extreme black holes, except for the supersymmetric ones, they're unstable. And they're unstable, so they're ground states, but they're completely lies. Any perturbation around them will completely break it up. And the claim along this line of thought is that everything that's extreme is just unstable. In fact, including even astrophysical black holes. So if you take four-dimensional asymptotically flat black holes and go and say, well, why don't we try to take the lowest possible energy? That would be an extremal curved black hole. Astrophysical ones are one or two percent away from that sometimes. So that's pretty interesting. They're unstable. That, at any rate, is a piece of law that's generally accepted, uh, at least by some. Some people say that everybody agrees. Uh, but you can see that there might be a little tension here between we understand ground states really, really well, in fact, nearly exactly, completely precisely, oh, and they're unstable. Um, so, of course, it was not pertaining to the same thing. This really was for the not supersymmetric. This was for the supersymmetric. But nonetheless, there would seem to be a little bit of uh, a tension here. And that's the one I want to explore. Let me try to actually be more specific, uh, just again in the just introduction here, really. Uh, in the black hole formula I wrote, the entropy, I pointed out there was a square root that said that the mass had better be big or else uh, this black hole would get an imaginary part in this area, so something would be wrong. And uh, well, it turns out that the energy for given charges has to be bigger than this. The black hole mass has to be bigger than this expression. And it's just a fact that in the ordinary GR, basically taking ordinary Einstein gravity, coupling it to just uh, a ordinary electromagnetic field, black hole solutions exist only for these masses. They just don't exist otherwise. And one could say that that means that when we saturate this inequality the mass, it's some kind of ground state that we're looking at. And we'd like to try to understand it in the sense of ground state or perhaps low-lying excitations and stuff like that. But this is a good example to say, what's the deal with supersymmetry? Extremality, the lowest possible energy, I sort of mentally think about as a ground state. But some people also say that supersymmetry is kind of the ground state. What's the relation between them? Well, supersymmetry is plain and simple stronger. It's plain and simple stronger. In this context of the familiar ones, the ones that appear in GR books, courses, supersymmetry involves something more. It involves that the mass should literally be equal to the charge. Actually, in other words, this angular momentum has to be equal to zero. Rotating black holes are not supersymmetric. This is the loophole that at least opens up for the idea that astrophysical, very strongly rotating black holes could in fact be unstable. That at least does not contradict things if one says the supersymmetric ones are the ones that we really understand. Extremal, well, we might think about them as ground states, but we're not so sure. So the hypothesis, the working hypothesis, and I'll give some evidence for this, is that extremal black holes in this context that do not have angular momentum zero, they're unstable. Do you talk only about flat space? Uh, in my introduction, I will later do only ADS. But, okay. No, but yeah. this claim about supersymmetry. Yes. Black holes only have yes. zero angular momentum. Yes, yes, this is just flat space. This is flat space, four dimensions, okay, I'm sorry. Yes. Why we can't have? Yeah, yeah well. I will review ADS-5 very carefully. It's much more, it's more complicated yeah. and more interesting. But this is background yes. for setting the tone. Now, one of the ways to start thinking about how could it possibly be that black holes would be unstable, even these asymptotically flat ones that we're studying in GR, 
Well, let me look at the uh, emission rates of Hawking quanta. This is a formula that says that there's some smooth function of the frequency. But importantly, there's this Bose-Einstein factor here that gives me my emission rate, depends on omega, that's the frequency or the energy, if you will, of the actual emitted quantum. Uh, there's also little m here, which is the SMU quantum number of the admitted uh, of the emitted quantum. Well, this formula here uh, shows that, uh, well, this might actually diverge. It might diverge if this thing here becomes um, zero or even worse, becomes negative. So if omega is really, really small, it diverges. So this might be the standard formula, but you certainly have questions here to say, well, really, what? What did I get wrong? You didn't get anything wrong. This really is what the formula says. Uh, the physics interpretation of this is that it's super radiance. Uh, it's not so useful in this context to look at the emission. It might be more useful to think about what happens if you send a particle in and see what comes back. The reflected amplitude is in fact bigger than what you send in. So you get more out than what you send in. So that's some kind of a negative absorption or whatever, if you will. Um, so this way you can extract energy from the black hole. It's very famous as the Penrose process, basically. So this has been known for you know, 50 years or something. But this is the context for saying, well, surely Carnuma black holes, they could be unstable because you know this is an instability that's very well known. Uh, it's one that uh, I think often people sort of don't really think much about. It seems like some kind of curiosity, but it's part of the hero of my story is this kind of story. Uh, one should say that in order to really make the black hole stable here, the way it is normally phrased is that you should take your curved black hole and you should put it in a box with reflecting boundary conditions. And in that way, if you have even a single Hawking quantum coming out, it will reflect back in and then come back out again even bigger. And this will be a runaway process. Runaway process called a black hole bomb. I can't tell you more about it because uh, funded by the Pentagon. Um, um, uh, but the story I want to tell is more limited. Uh, it's saying, well, but this was the bomb. Yes, yes, that was well known. But what if the temperature vanishes? What about this formula here? It seems like then various things goes to zero, go to infinity, and exactly what the physical nature of the limit is might not be entirely clear. But I claim that the super radiant instability persists even as the temperature goes to zero when you don't emit anything whatsoever. It's actually still unstable. It's still unstable. And if I look at my formula, I'll find that this happens at exceptionally low energy. I have to go lower than uh, basically this is the Schwarzschild type radius, so a couple of kilometers. And that means that my, uh, if it's a solar mass black hole, that my wavelength should then be as longer than that. My energy should be such that, um, such that uh, the corresponding wavelength is bigger than the size of the black hole. But for such things, there's an instability. And it's believed even that it's significant in astrophysics if extreme light scalars exist, such as axions, for example, that might be super, super light. So this is the kind of story I want to explore, but I want to explore it in the ADSCT context I was already asked. We can do more there, we can uh, be more precise. And I want to then tell you a bit about that story here that was just done here for illustrative purposes in asymptotically flat space in ADS. So that's what I want to, to do, talk about extremal black holes, in ADS-5, special attention to instabilities, and in fact, specially take the uh, approach that in order to establish something is unstable, it's enough to establish its onset. It's also interesting to ask, what would they decay to when it goes all the way, but I'll primarily focus just on what is the onset, what is the unstable mode? If you try to sort of put an extremal black hole there and saying, well, you're telling me it's unstable, where does it first go? Where does it first go? And then the second part will be about nearly supersymmetric black holes. So there are two things here. One is they're still extremal, but let me make them not just extremal, but supersymmetric. There's supposed to be some kind of loophole there that if they're extremal, but not supersymmetric, these arguments here are supposed to fail. So we'd like to see how. What is nearly supersymmetric? I don't know. Like it, I mean, it means just quantitatively that there, I mean, I'll give you a parameter that says that uh, that the excitation energy away from the supersymmetric limit, I mean, the supersymmetry would be some kind of BPS limit, think M equal Q. And if M is a little bit bigger, basically M over Q is still very near one, but not exactly one, that would be nearly. 
And uh, in fact, as you'll see, it's it's a very new, and I'll be quite. It, there's an H bar in there too. It has to be very new. Um, yeah. Other questions? Uh, I worked on this general thing for the last three, four years or so, and have written a bunch of papers and writing some more. But but this thing here is actually quite focused on some work that's nearly done. That's uh, with two students that are graduating, Nizar and Siegel, um, that you may also meet around in the world of physics. So any questions before I sort of get going a little more seriously? Still, I'm going to go very slowly and very, very low brow. Hope you're not going to get too bored. So first, just to introduce black holes in ADS-5, Often we geometrize them and say not ADS5, but say ADS5 cross S5. What we have in mind is that we have a theory that is maximally symmetric. The symmetry of the theory has a conformal symmetry. So the Lorentz group is enhanced to SO2, 4. There's a sphere. So there's a rotation group, SO6. And we have supersymmetry that I'm not going to spell out, but that's the supersymmetric completion of these Poisson groups. The reason I mention these groups is that it's very clear they each have rank three, and that means that we need three quantum numbers to specify the state that sits inside these things. The SO2, 4 representation is that we have a conformal weight, which is basically the energy in the context of a black hole. And we have two rotation parameters, which you can think about as angular momenta inside ADS5. A five-dimensional context, there's not a single angular momenta, there are two independent ones, and so four has rank two, instead of rank one, as we're familiar with in ordinary quantum mechanics. So all told in ADS-5, there are three quantum numbers. And then in addition, in this context, there's some charges, which from the five-dimensional point of view would just be ordinary electromagnetic fields. But from the sphere point of view, they are rotation along the five-sphere. I'll mostly take the five-dimensional view and just say that there's some charges around. And in fact, there are three different kinds. For the most part, I'm going to take the three different types equal. But the upshot here is that the asymptotic data of a black hole in ADS-5 is that the mass I can give, I can give you two angular momenta, I can give you three R charges, Q. And then if I take those data and say, can I find a supersymmetric representation? Well, that gives a condition. Roughly speaking, the supercharges, they anti-commute. In order for them to anti-commute, it gives basically the P in the superalgebra, which is the mass, and some central extensions which are the Qs and Js. And it turns out then that in order for there to be supersymmetry of the theory, in order for the unitarity of the quantum system, the mass basically is given. And it's given in terms of the conserved charges and is the sum of the five. So I say I'm mostly going to take the two Js actually equal and the three Qs equal to each other just for the purpose of a talk and make things simpler. But it's nice to think about it this way, that there are six because the whole system had rank six. And then we take a special case to make life simpler. The other thing I want to say is not going to play a very central role, but it is important, is that there's a scale here. We obviously have our Newton coupling constant, G5, often set to 1. We also have our ADS5 scale, L or something, often put equal to 1. And then we have a ratio that's dimensionless that you really shouldn't put equal to 1 because, uh, you know, it's a dimensionless number. And in fact, it's a number that I'm going to call a half n squared. That half n squared would be, if I'm dual here to an issue n super young mills, it really would be the n of the super young mills. But in gravity, you can think about it just as we want to parameterize this dimensionless ratio. And n better be a bit big, such that this black hole is not Planck scale sized, or more or less that the ADS space is not Planck sized. So it's just a parameterization of how big the ADS space is. But it is what will set the scale of each of these Qs and Ms. They will be of order n squared in order for this to be a proper uh, black hole. Uh, if you have small corrections to it, they would be of order one or whatever. And I'll talk a little bit about actually what order they'd be. So are you but, going to take subfitting orders in the one over n correction? Like, yeah. You know, that is a very interesting sport that I've spent way too much on and uh, uh, time on. But no, today, no. So Way simple. Planar, Way simple. Planar, limit. planar limit. That sounds so technical. It's as if I was doing quantum field theory. I'm not. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I can, mm -hmm. but I, I, you know, but I was not planning. Yeah. To... But you can call that. You can call this yeah. planar limit. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Okay. Um, 
So the data we get in this context is that we get the entropy of the black holes. And this is the entropy. Is the entropy in the special case where it is supersymmetric, so you see no mass. The mass has to be equal to the sum of these five charges. And once the mass is put equal to that, the entropy is some function of the five charges, some function, this function. This is the function that you would like to explain if you go and look in the corresponding quantum field theory and say, I must have some brown state degeneracy, and this is it. But there's a catch. But that's the catch that I think is very interesting, which is this is not just when the mass is equal to the sum of charges. There's an extra relation. In fact, the quantum numbers of supersymmetric black holes that have this entropy formula, they satisfy a constraint. So there are these five charges, but you cannot vary them independently. The five charges must satisfy this nonlinear monster, which is sort of complicated looking, still very algebraic in a way, but it's some relation between the five charges family of black holes that are supersymmetric, you should both specify the mass, which is just the sum of charges, and then you should ensure that the charges satisfy this. In particular, what that means is that once we're in ADS space, rotation is mandatory. If you look at this constraint and wonder if J equals zero could satisfy it, you will find that it cannot. So rotation is not something that is optional. It is mandatory if you want supersymmetry. So is this empirical or is this a is this a this is a feature of the known black holes? This is a feature of the known black holes. We do not yet know about the unknowns. That was a joke. <laughs> so yes, this appears unfamiliar and surprising, and at some level you might even say, well, let's go look. We have to find more black holes or some such thing. And that definitely is an attitude. But do recall what I said in the very beginning as my introduction. To be supersymmetric, even for 4D Kernuman black holes, the textbook ones, you do need two conditions. You need to specify the mass, something to do with the charges, and then you have a constraint on the charges. It's just that that constraint is so boring, J equals zero, that you might kind of dismiss it as being barely worth calling an equation. But it is an equation. It is something that says that we have a co-dimension two parameter space of supersymmetric black holes. Extremal ones are co-dimension one because the mass is minimal. Supersymmetric is co-dimension two. That's true for the ordinary black holes. It's also true here. What is different is that it's a much more complicated co-dimension two. So it sticks out on your face, unlike this one here, where you might have said, oh, I anyway ignore rotation because it's complicated or something. Right? But so the statement is, extremal black holes that violate the constraint, their constraint being, in this case, the ADS-5 black hole constraint, they're unstable. That would be the hypothesis. So this is the story. The supersymmetric mass, basically sum of charges, that's the unitarity bound. We cannot even find quantum representations that violate it. Mass equal to sum of charges is kind of the absolute minimum. But the extremal ADS Kernuman black holes, they have more mass. M is bigger than the BPS mass. Here is sort of a little thing that we should go to larger charge, larger J. And there's some kind of valley sitting here. This, uh, this flag here is above the valley. That's the supersymmetric ones. So if you add charge, if you are at a charge that actually satisfies the constraint, you can add more mass. And you can think about that as an excitation of the supersymmetric ground state. But you also have these valleys here which are the other ground states. And if you're sitting out here somewhere on the valley uh, sides, that corresponds to taking a Q and J that does not satisfy the constraint. Constraint is a line in the QJ plane. And uh, if you were here at the three dimension plane, you would think about the QJ plane as being some kind of a plane. There's a line in it, which is BPS. And then it has an energy, which is sort of going up. And the minimum possible energy is some kind of valley. And we can think about this thing up here as being some kind of excitation energy over the minimal unitarity bound. And well, at least in the corresponding quantum field theory, we do in fact have some states that are down here. There's no particular good reason that we should satisfy the constraint. You know, they don't really stand out from the quantum field theory point of view. So if you take your favorite BPS representation in the quantum field theory, you know that there definitely are states for any Q and J 
you don't necessarily know that there are order n square states or e to the n square states. There's so many of them, you don't really know, but I can come with, clearly come with quite a few examples, no matter what Q and J is. Right. But can I come with enough to a black hole's worth? No, no. Hard enough at the supersymmetric lowers. Right. So that's my playground. So let me remind you about how instability works. A simple model, the simplest, of how could we get something unstable in this kind of context is to play with a scale of field that has some mass and put it in ADS. And if you just put it a standard sort of uh, just Klein-Gordon equation, ADS, the wave equation turns out to be pretty much a Schrodinger equation. It's a Schrodinger equation, it's a one dimension, this K vector here, it's just a spatial vector, put it equal to zero if you will. But the important part is that this thing here is a one over R squared potential. And one over R squared potentials, they're not quite the Coulomb potentials. In Coulomb potentials, you know the positive energy corresponds to not bound state, negative energy corresponds to bound state. One over R squared is a little more complicated. You have to be sufficiently strong than one of R squared potential in order to actually have a bound state. And once it does have a bound state, that corresponds to an exponentially damped wave function. And in the current context, once you put in what omega actually is, that's an unstable mode. If you have a bound state in this one of our z squared potential, there's an unstable mode. And that's how you get the bright and lunar frequent bound, which is famous. The mass in ADS units have to be bigger than a certain thing that depends on the dimension. And if the mass is bigger than that, this one of our square type potential is not so strong. It's not so deep, and therefore it has no bound states, and therefore everything is stable. If this bound is violated, it's a deeper well. If it's a deeper well, this thing here allows it to simply exhibit an actual unstable mode, which is a certain hypergeometric function or something like that. So therefore, we think about this as saying, when we violate the bound, we simply exhibit a mode. And we exhibit a mode, which mode? The one that satisfied that sort of notation. So we could go pursue that more in more detail, but I'm gonna be happy enough with just reminding myself what the bright and lunar frequent bound is and what it means. It means that I have an exponential runaway mode. Uh, if I violate the bound. So do I? Well, I am interested here in looking at solutions like the ads kerr newman but they have to be supergravity. I want to have them embedded into the actual theory I'm looking at. So N equal four super young mills is dual to N equal eight supergravity is a theory that has a number of complications that are usually being ignored. You know, there are 42 scalars, uh, the lightest of them, 20 of them has mass m squared l squared equal to minus four. So they look tachyonic, but they're not that tachyonic. In fact, the bright moment Friedman bound, if we check it here for d equals four, it says that this inequality says that the mass should be bigger than or equal to minus four. So minus four is exactly what these 20 guys have. They are living life dangerously. They are exactly at the bright moment of frequent bound. If something came along and corrected the minus four to ever so slightly less, we would have an unstable mode. But as long as we just take supergravity in ADS-5, go by the book, it's exactly at minus four. So we are exactly at the boundary where we could have had an unstable mode, but we don't. Scalars on the verge of instability. This is textbook ADS-5, right? But the question I want to ask is that, yeah, but that was ADS-5. We don't want ADS-5. We want asymptotically ADS-5. We have a black hole environment. The black hole environment means that we can think about it as if we have an effective mass everywhere. That effective mass is sort of different. It's this kind of effective mass when we're very far away and only see the ADS. But as you go further in, our local wave equation will be something different. Something different. And we're wondering what? Does that different thing actually have an unstable mode. And that's not so obvious because it's in a very different background. The way to think about this and the way to analyze it is using an attractor flow. It's an extremely very well developed idea in ungauged supergravity that you start with scalar fields and other such things. They flow inwards radially. You can even think about it as a time evolution and that could be useful. But something happens at the end of the day near the horizon. And how to figure out what happened at the horizon and related to the data at infinity is something that is not trivial, but that's what the attractor flow solves. So that 
problem that it solves. It is very well understood in ungauged supergravity. In gauge supergravity, not much has been done. Partially just, yeah, well, it's probably the same as ungauged supergravity. So that one, no, no. It's a lot harder. And since it's a lot harder, you may think that it's probably because it's trivial and not worth doing. You know, harder does not mean trivial. In fact, they're kind of going the opposite way. So at any rate, there are complicating factors in this context. Gauge supergravity is different from ungauged supergravity. And look, we have ADS vacuum. Any belief supergravity is a gauge supergravity. Oh, and as I mentioned, supersymmetric black holes, they must rotate. That makes the whole radial thing a little bit more iffy because it's sort of radial and co-rotating-ish kind of thing. So a little bit harder, but needs to be dealt with. Oh, and I don't want the supersymmetric case. The supersymmetric attractor flows are quite well understood, uh, especially in the ungauged case, but I want the extremal attractor flows. I want to sort of flow inwards for all extremal black holes. In fact, I want to know what's the difference between having a supersymmetric flow versus something that is just extreme. So these are three complications that is enough to um, drive a grad student crazy. Uh, uh, but the upshot is that once you have done a lot of work, then you say, oh, these scalars we had, they will effectively correspond to some kind of ADS2 scale that sits in the near horizon region, and that is the most vulnerable to be unstable. So that mode in there might or might not satisfy the BF bound. And if it does satisfy the BF bound, it's stable in the entire flow. So what you need to do is to solve the flow. Now, the first step, though, is to actually go back and say, well, I'm going to look at this Kernuman ADS black hole. I'm just studying that. I could look at other things. What is it exactly? Well, I'm not going to write down the metric for you. But technically, what it is is that it's a solution. It's a solution to what theory? Well, the Einstein-Maxwell ADS theory. But that's not the theory I want. I want supergravity. So I need to interpret this solution that was found in the Einstein-Maxwell ADS theory as a solution to inequality supergravity. And that's why I need to look at what are my matter content. In particular, I have an issue for R symmetries, the one that's inherited from the N equal four Subayang mills. There's an issue for R symmetry. That means I have 15, 15 vector fields. I don't have just one. Maxwell, by nature, has one. But here I have 15 equally worthy gauge fields in bulk. And if I'm saying I want my Einstein Maxwell, my, my Kerr Newman solution to be a regular Kerr Newman, just the geometry I already found, it should be a solution though to this bigger theory. I have to specify which of the 15 fields is actually the gauge field that you think about as the Maxwell field that is turned on in your solution. And I actually want to pick among the 15 one that has the property that it permits my scalars to be constant because my Kernuma black hole doesn't have scalars turned on. The scalars are not depending on where I am in space time. In my original Kernuma black hole, there are no scalar fields. I have only Einstein Maxwell, there is no scalar. So, to the extent I'm analyzing that black hole as a solution to this theory, I have to insist that my scalars are not turned on. That means I can go and look at my Maxwell equations, all 15 of them, and see what does it take for it to be consistent to make the scalars constant. More precisely, look at my time Gordon type equations, which are going to be sourced by the charged fields. And I have to pick the charged fields in such a way that the source always vanishes. This specifies a breaking path. It turns out that it says, which of the 15 should I take? Which linear combination should I take? It's the one that tells me I can have constant scalars. Group theoretically, it means that uh, I have an SP3 that is preserved, that will rotate and still preserve the solution. You can see it as being kind of the SO6, which you might often think about as some six by six matrix with ones and minus ones. And then you can kind of, if you squint a little bit, see that it looks like there's some symplectic group sitting in there because there are three ones and three minus ones. And that's how you should embed. That's the one of the 15 you should take. And then you've got 14 left. And they are just fields. And these are fields that you can think about as vector fields that are now freely propagating in this background. And then you have your 42 scalars. And the lovely thing is that the 42 scalars are not turned on in the background. It's at linear order, they don't have a source. So I can look at it at quadratic order. 
these scalars. And these are my modes that I want to wander. Are they stable or are they not? What is complicated here is that I do have all these other fields around because I have a background field strength with particular group theory quantum numbers. I haven't been very clear about exactly what they are, but they're specific. That means that all my 42 scalars, they're also in various representations of issue four. And what, how they transform under the one field that is turned on is completely specified by group theory. And what I cannot do is to say, oh, aren't they just neutral spectator fields? No, they're not. They're in whatever group, whatever representation this breaking pattern tells me they have to be in. So I have implicitly by saying, which black hole is it that I'm looking at? What is the Maxwell field that is turned on? I kind of told you couplings for all the fluctuations around it implicitly. And those are the ones that we have to go and harvest, both by some group theory stuff, but also by literally expanding to quadratic order or you know, work hard and check that everything actually works out and stuff. It turns out that eight of the fields are neutral under the background. So they do not transform under the issue four or under the one you one that stays. So that's a good place to start. So we should ask, are they unstable? But are they unstable once they propagate from infinity into the horizon? And that looks a little bit bad because at the horizon, the right on a Friedman bound is minus a quarter d squared, but now we have an EDS two. The limit is a quarter. Quarter is much smaller than four by a factor 16, in fact, but it's smaller. But at the same time, the ADS2 radius changed relative to the ADS5 radius. The ADS2 radius is a length scale, but it's not the same length scale. So you have to go and compute that. So in fact, you have to look at this radio, radio uh, this ratio. And the fate of these scalars depends on how big is that ratio. Is it such that this is violated or not violated? It turns out that for these eight scalars, actually they stay stable for Reisler Nordstrom. Reisler Nordstrom is when I have charge but no rotation. On the other hand, they are unstable for Kerr, which is when I have rotation and no charge. This is what I identify as having a field that is susceptible to super radiant instability. It can, in fact, run away. And it will run away exponentially. So this is what I expected. When these black holes are kind of rotating, then if they're rotating enough, I have an unstable mode. And I can tell you where in the supergravity does it sit. I could translate it to n equal four and say, which operator is it that is first turned on? But there's an unpleasant thing here. The unstable region says there should be enough angular momentum. Actually, this includes the BPS black holes. This instability, as explained there, is unstable even for the PPS level. This looks like something is wrong, and indeed something is wrong. I'm just mentioning it because you see these things in papers, and well, the new generation of papers that we, we, is why we sometimes do things more carefully, is that clearly something is wrong. And what is wrong? What is wrong is that, well, here I'm pretending that my neutral scalar it just satisfies a Klein-Gordon equation. But how did I know that? It can't just satisfy a Klein-Gordon equation with the mass I have from ADS5. It has to be the actual equation I get by expanding around my background. And when I expand around my background, I have to be careful. There are kinetic terms for vectors in supergravity. These ones here, you can think about as all 15 ones, but in particular, one of them is turned on. Right? One of them is the one that sits in the background. The kinetic term depends on scalar fields. Now what you need to do is you need to expand this one around the background. And then you get a fourth order term, sort of a phi squared, F squared kind of term. But in this ADS2 environment near the horizon, the F squared is pretty much constant. It's just you know, straight, uh, straight uh, electric field. So therefore, this coupling will effectively look like a mass. What it really is, is that it's what we would call a polycoupler. It's a coupling to a charged fields, but the fields are neutral, yet it actually couples to the F mu nu directly, not to A mu the way it normally does in a, non, in a minimal coupling, but it couples to the F mu nu. And that coupling gives an effective mass. This is the effective mass. And for the particular field I'm talking about right now, or this I should say this term here is such 
that this is a positive contribution to the mass. It's a positive contribution. Electric fields are going to give positive contributions like that. You can figure that out by the fact that this one here had to have signs such that this was stable in ordinary supergravity, and therefore the N, even without looking at it in detail, you would say definitely you can say certain things about the signs, and what you can figure out is that definitely have to be positive. Once you do it more detailed, you figure out that P actually is one. So whatever, but that requires an actual computation. So you get a positive contribution, and this is good enough that these unstable scalars I told you about, they were stable for Reister Nordstrom, unstable for Kerr, and in the middle, they were a bit too unstable because they were unstable even when you were at the supersymmetric locus. They now end up eating up a bit more mass, precisely such that they're unstable all the time when you're on the Kerr side. They're unstable all the way into the BPS line. In other words, it sort of says that precisely these scalars have this super radiant instability. Because of rotation, they can be shed out. And that mechanism, of course, works only if you sort of have enough rotation. Because if you have no rotation at all, it wouldn't work, like in a Weston Orstone black hole. How much is enough? Such that you are on one side, on the angular momentum too big side of the constraint. The constraint was an equality. And you can think about it as angular momentum being so big that it gets positive, or so little that is negative, or j equals zero, or is negative. By convention, I'm going to take it to be that is positive for, for, for j being big. And it has two sides. On the side of rapid rotation, these neutral scalars are unstable. And they're unstable all the way from pure curve, just rotation, and adding on charge enough that you go into the Supersymmetric limit. So questions on this? Because then there's the other side. There were 20 scalars that all of them were living life dangerously, sitting right at the boundary where maybe they were about to become unstable. Eight of them were neutral. The 12, in a way, are worse. They're worse because they actually are charged under the background. It means that if you do the group theory and say, among these 20, how does the 20 actually transform under an SU4? And how does it transform under the SP3 subgroup of that SU4? And does that mean that in the end of the day, that the U1 that sits in the diagonal, the one that we turn on, what charge do the scalars have under that? Well, for eight of them, nothing. For 12 of them, charge two. It means that these scalars, they have a minimal coupling to the background vector field, with a little e being two. It follows from group theory and from direct computation. So it means that the kinetic term of the scalars themselves is not just a minimal kinetic term, like when you write down an ordinary Klein-Gordon kind of field or study 5-4 theory, whatever. It has an extra coupling to the gauge field, like in scalar electrodynamics. It has an extra a mu. If you think about that in the context of ADS2, you can think about this as being a kinetic term plus a term that goes like a mu squared. So in fact, you can in that context think about it as an effective mass. Moreover, it's a negative effective mass. In my sign conventions, it is such that when I have an electric field, an electric potential, this thing here goes negative. So once I have a black hole that has electric charge with an environment that has potential, Potential with a sign that is such is electric type potential, it will give a negative mass contribution to these charge scalars. So they were originally on the boundary. Now they're in trouble. In fact, the background electric potential now give the charge scalars an expectation value. It means that I said that I didn't have to turn them on. Well, that was in the expectation that this was a stable thing to do. It is true that this was a solution to my equations of motion, but nobody says this was a stable solution to the equations of motion. And now I've found that it is not. In fact, the scalars will turn on by themselves and get bigger and bigger and bigger, and they will get an expectation value. When charged scalars, scalars that are charged under electromagnetism, get an expectation value that is called superconductivity. 
So the near horizon region becomes superconducting. It's a thing that uh, was studied a lot, especially starting about 15 years ago, give and take, or something like that. Holographic superconductivity was much studied. But at the time, people, they usually neglected actually embedding things into full supergravity. They said, let me just take a charge scale of field in holography. Why? Because that's interesting. Let me just state it, and let me take its charge, its mass, and just tune it as I wish because I'm interested in figuring out what happens. Very interesting exercise. This is different in that I've actually embedded the whole thing and said, look, I had a system that had preordained dynamics that was not designed to be such that I got superconductivity. It's what came out, not something I put in. And superconductivity applies when the black hole is under-rotating, when the electric field is big and rotation is not so big. So the first diagram I get is this one here. My extreme black holes have a Q and a J, there's a BPS line when they are in a certain relation to one another, and that is not particularly illuminating relation, but it is something that does not allow J being zero or Q being zero, it's a line in the middle. The unstable modes that I'm able to exhibit, eight of them apply here all the way into the line. 12 of them apply here, all the way into the line. So it was known, or he's argued some time ago, that here, there should be super radiance and stability. We're extending it all the way in. It was argued some 10, 12 years ago that there would be superconductivity probably here, except they forgot a term, they forgot the Pauli term, but it didn't mess up the conclusion. And it now extends all the way in there. So that's the phase diagram. There are sort of three phases, but one of them is a line. At the level of supergravity, it's literally a line. So any questions here? So the difference between the super radius and the supergravity is whether it's a charge field or not. In both cases, there's some condensation and some scalar. Yeah, no, so it, it, look, so I'm, I would say that it's mostly what was said before. Yeah, that I think that, yeah, so, so maybe I'm exaggerating what, yeah, I, I would say that, yeah, that's fair, that's fair. That's fair, that's fair, that it's, it's some, some scalars that condense, you can say. Mm -hmm. It's more just that when char scalars condense, then my linear response function have funny stuff that is reminds you of superfluidity. Uh, when these other guys do it, it's something else. It's, it's, it's more like Cherenkov radiation, different kind of physics, but. Other questions? What's the, the dual Q of the analog of these effects? Well, that's exactly it's uh, super conductivity. <laughs> so in any plus four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. Have we exhibited it? No. But I can tell you now what operators to go look for. Right? And hopefully we can find a consistent truncation of any plus four that exhibits it very clearly. Right? But also there's a little bit more of the story still, because at some level, what I've done here is a, it is not inconsistent, but it's the onset. It corresponds to being here, but having way, way more energy, and then telling you that it is unstable. In which direction is it unstable? It's unstable towards superconductivity. Ah, but where does it end? Is that a superconducting phase? Because all sorts of other stuff could get turned on to be analyzed. Fine. I mean, there are results on this, not just by us, but your Osman wall in particular is interesting. It's in 80s four, but it was still, they had a paper last year, uh, mostly on the, well, actually, that was on this line, that was on this line, but uh, but whichever, they're interested in this question. Um, so indeed, look, there will be more on this, how to do a better job on any for superior mills. But first things first, learn from the black hole. I, and I think it's fair to say, this was not trivial. So there's nothing more. So th this Pauli contribution, I mean, yeah. did, did you really need to do a detailed calculation to see that it would give you stability all the way to the line or is this yeah. something you could have anticipated? No, 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 no. I mean, only indirectly. I mean, I was sort of guessing it that it's sort of, but, but I don't think, yeah, it's a very detailed computation. I mean, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's a complicated function of parameters. Because also, I mean, it's, 
you know, it, 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 I mean, J over Q, it's, it's a non, these are non, you saw the, saw the constraint, for example. These are sort of non-trivial functions. And the fact that it goes everywhere, could it have crossed? I don't see why not. Of course, physically, I would have been really surprised if I had found an instability of a supersymmetric black hole, right? So I'd say, well, it surely can't be somehow. But, and yes, then you need to do it, but you needed to get the exact right coupling. And the F mu nu is, is, is you know, it depends. I mean, remember, this is not just in an ADS2 that has constant electromagnetic fields, constant, but it has a squashed S3 and it rotates. So therefore the dependence on the parameters of the black hole are kind of a little complicated. Not super complicated, but think like the constraint. They involve ratios of weird polynomials that once they all cancel out, it's because, because you did it right. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, it's not sort of just built in, it's not trivial. The part about adding, like, say, alpha prime directions or something, it's not clear that you'll still get this. Clear. It is not clear, but I assume the supersymmetry will keep doing its magic. I mean, I mean, assuming that you're putting your alpha prime corrections in a tasteful manner that is consistent with supersymmetry. <laughs> so, uh, right. Um, but exactly, if it does dump in, you know, Gauss Bonnet, maybe. So, this still leaves the curve, the BPS curve. So what I have here is that there's a phase transition on the BPS curve. And this is understood, kind of, as in BPS black holes, at least it's said, we understand what their ground state is in any co-force by young mills. I do think that's overselling a little bit. I surely would like to understand it better, but whichever. Let me pretend I understand it, and at any rate say that that is at least the place where we understand it best microscopically. What happens when we deform away from the supersymmetric locus? One thing to point out here is that there are two ways to deform away. One is to raise the energy by a little bit. Basically, do not have mass equal sum of charges. Mass equal sum of charges plus a little bit. Or violate the constraint by a little bit. It's nearly satisfied, but the Q's and J's are a little bit different than what it takes. In the canonical ensemble, one way to say that you violate the constraint is that you take an electric potential and a rotational potential, which actually would have given zero if this was exactly supersymmetric, but you make it a little bit non-zero. And that's the constraint violation way of doing things that is analogous to adding temperature, which was adding energy. And it's interesting that the additional mass you get looks like this. And what is interesting about it is that the T squared and phi squared deformations have the same prefactor that I call gamma. So to add a little extra temperature, how much does it cost? It costs something, but to violate the constraint, how much does that cost? Same thing. I mean, there's a two pi, that was a convention. That is because even though we're going away from supersymmetry, supersymmetry still protects us a little bit. We have spontaneously violated N equal two supersymmetry. We actually have non-linearly realized N equal two supersymmetry, even when it isn't supersymmetric. And that's strong enough to tell us that they had to appear in this combination. That it had to be that these things had only one parameter, basically an overall sigma model that as one coupling constant, instead of having independent ones for each direction you could possibly deform it. So supergravity confirms this, but this is something that was said by symmetry. And that's why does it take this form as I'm deforming? Then there is the gamma, what is its size? That's the dimension full scale that in fact will answer sort of Sui's question, how close do you have to be to PPS to be close enough? you know, how super symmetric. Now, one thing about that that was understood already 30 years ago was that, and in fact was understood probably by Boltzmann or something like that. But anyway, when you try to take super symmetric, uh, take thermodynamics and go to really, really, really low temperatures, you get in trouble. And the trouble is such that you have in mind that everything is thermal. That means that the typical energy of a signal quantum is sort of like around the temperature or something like that. But once you go very, very low and your energy gets so low 
that the total energy you have available is not enough to populate even a single quantum, you know that it couldn't possibly be true that you could still use thermodynamics. What thermodynamics gives you is not consistent with the idea that the energy was nicely partitioned in the way thermodynamics says it is, so thermodynamics is inconsistent. As you go really, really close to zero temperature, you are in trouble. So we know that thermodynamics actually has to go wrong when we go all the way down to t equal to zero. And mind you, t equals zero is the only thing I've talked about so far, right? So we should worry here that actually extremal is unhealthy. And when is it unhealthy? It's unhealthy when the temperature violates this, when it violates this. So if thermodynamics is adequate, the entropy is linear in T that corresponds to a density of states that looks like e to the square root of E with a factor here that makes it E dimensionless, often put equal to a half in the literature. But here I'm emphasizing that it really does have dimension. So half is a, not such a good thing because that doesn't have dimension. So this is what thermodynamics says. If you think you have an entropy that's linear in T, this is what your row of E should look like. But you also know that when you get to really low energies, this got to be wrong. It got to be that there are fewer states than this. This is really interesting because this is a case where quantum corrections are large, yet the geometry is smooth. As you take a very low energy black hole and turn it more and more extremely, the endpoint does not jump. It jumps to polarly, but not geometrically. It's smooth all the way. So this is a case where quantum mechanics dominates, yet the geometry is smooth. It's a nice setting to have. The effective low energy theory for this is the Schwarzschild, especially famous with studying SYK and his low energy, uh, low energy uh, excitations. But I think that the interesting thing is that it can do this. It's the effective theory of the low energy thermodynamics in the regime where it's fully quantum. When you solve this theory, what you find is that this uh, e to the square root of e, e being the one of them at the exponential, the other the energy. I said it had to be depleted. How is it depleted? Well, the e to the square root of e turns into a cinch. Cinch is less than the exponential, right? When e is big, it's just the exponential, but when e becomes smaller, this goes all the way down to zero, unlike an exponential, then it becomes one when it is zero, right? So it got depleted. It got depleted. It got depleted in such a way that to the best of our understanding, if we look at the quantum fluctuations in the throat, what we find is that the energy of states, the density of states at energy equal to zero is zero. That's very uncomfortable. We thought there was supposed to be a massive degeneracy here. And sometimes people indeed would have said, look, black holes have this massive degeneracy. Sorry. Yes, sir. Saying it's boring and I should no, know this. I don't know. This. <laughs> doesn't like you. So, um, so at any rate, it had to be depleted somehow. But the fact that it got depleted so badly that there were no states left is a bit of an uncomfortable situation. In fact, from this point of view, it says that there is a huge quantum fluctuation cloud in there in the ADS. And it's such that when you're sort of trying to look behind it, there was nothing. Something is weird. In fact, this by itself can lead you to argue that surely extremal black holes are unstable. This is inconsistent. Happily, this is the non-supersymmetric computation. If you do the supersymmetric computation, it works differently. There's a different failure mode. The failure mode is that there actually is a mass gap. There is a bunch of states, in fact, e to the entropy many, at exactly energy equal to zero. This is energy relative to the supersymmetric one. And then there is a small gap. And above that gap, it looks pretty much like this. But it means thermodynamics fails a different way, whether it is supersymmetric or non-supersymmetric. The way that works is that we have a low effective field theory. In the supersymmetric case, we have a supergroup 
four supercharges. We can do the fluctuations of those using nonlinear stigma model kind of technology, but in boundary conditions on superspace that are such that we preserve supersymmetry. And that gives a free energy. The free energy is given by the Schwarzschild. But importantly, the Schwarzschild with sector U1 kind of field, which is my hero. That's the script phi, the one that corresponds to allowing excitations that violate the constraint. If sigma is zero, I don't violate the constraint. If I turn sigma on, I do violate the constraint. And in the quantum theory, I don't know which it is because it's fluctuating. It's fluctuating. I can asymptotically state what my boundary conditions are, but I can't pull it throughout. In fact, what I have to do is that I have to compute this one here. It's my Schwarz in action. I have to compute it on shell. What does it give on shell? It gives the correct answer. I have fiddled the, I forgot a gamma here. But otherwise, I have fiddled with the various normalizations such that this was correct. On a saddle point approximation, that is a solution, classical solution to this, I get my quadratic approximation, but that was not my point. My point is that you should do the fluctuation determinants around the saddle point. You should do the you know, fluctuations. What are the fluctuations? Well, you have fluctuations from, uh, well, gravitational mode, these extra U1 modes, the R charge, and some fermions. And these ones in general depend on the temperature. And depending on the temperature that potentially is very violent, T to the three quarters, you know, goes to zero as T is equal to zero. These are the pieces that are the non-supersymmetric modes that actually is why there are no states at T equal to zero. It's because this classical action has E to the T squared. Looks like when T is zero, it gives one. But the determinant in front is T to the three half. That's zero. So therefore, trying to use classical all the way down is a mistake. You kind of have, what well, you might have thought were just log corrections or something like that. But think about it as pre-factor to the exponential. However, here, this goes to zero. If we have the non-supersymmetric contributions, it gets even worse when we have our extra U1 field. Oh, and then we have fermions that cancel them. So therefore, this uh, particular thing here is not illuminating, although it has a lot of physics in it, actually. But the point I want to get across here is that the temperature factors actually cancel. So the thing that sits in front of the exponential, once we do our saddle point approximation, is finite. Now we can go do a better job because sum of all saddle points, you get some kind of, uh, you know, each of them have a saddle point, we have various determinants. And the way this all works out group theoretically is that we can split it up into two different kinds of supersymmetric multiplets. Some that are really short, one value of R charge, that is called Q here. Some that are quite short, they have two values of R charge. So this is a matter of what representations of my supergroup do I have? This is what gives me that there really was an exponential degeneracy at the exact zero. That's why it was a delta function. And then I got this thing here that was effectively this same kind of stuff. But the important part was not so much that, it was that there was a gap. There's a gap. There's a gap. Right. So this was the story kind of quick on the Schwarzschild. It's also not really my work, although I've embellished on other people's work on this one, but you know. Um, um, but I'm just emphasizing it here is that that work was also getting to the conclusion that supersymmetric and non-supersymmetric are very different from the point of view of the quantum fluctuations that dominate. Then for me, one of the interesting points here uh, is that um, the magnitude of the gap. The magnitude of the gap comes out of this. And if it was this a gamma that sat there in front, it's known as the long string scale, because if this was a CFT2, we know really what we are doing. But the CFT4, not so much. Nevertheless, you can compute it in gravity. This is what it looks like. I think you will agree with me that it's a sort of thing that is not illuminating, yet it is explicit. Um, and the point here is that, yeah, it's the kind of thing these things get. Polynomials that look impenetrably confusing, but they're not like really complicated functions. They are just polynomials. So please get this from any kofor schubert mills. This is what it means when you understand the ground state. To quadratic order away from your ground state, please. What's the coefficient? What's the coefficient? If you understand your ground state, surely you can do the leading excitations, right? Or the gap above it. Well, this scale here, if I just put in my n squared, vanishes in the supergravity approximation. So that was the answer, was that how wide is the line? Supergravity approximation, the BPS line is zero. It's the next order in one over n squared. 
So therefore, there is no width. On the other hand, when we do the quantum theory, we know there is a width. The width is of order one or n squared. It's down by order one or n squared. So supergravity point of view, it's a line. But in the actual theory, the quantum theory, it gets thickened of order one or n squared. And all, not just of order one or n squared, with a very specific coefficient, right? This is how thick the line is. And it depends a little bit on where along the lines you are. This is a very concrete, explicit prediction that this is what has to happen. Do I understand it from any proportions of Bergen Mills? Absolutely not. Far from it. In fact, where we're at these days is that we say we understand the ground state entropy. It's kind of true. But the way that understanding works is that we start with free integral force to bigger mills. We do various kinds of counting. We have a lot of struggle with imposing a singlet condition, which involves, it's kind of like an interaction, and even though it's kind of also just kinematics. But once you do all this correctly, which for many years it wasn't done, but once it's done correctly, you do get the ground state entropy out, it seems. But you don't quite know what it was that you counted. Oh, and now I ask anyway, well, you counted free fields. What dimension were they? Well, I don't know. There were fermions that had a dimension a half, and scalars that a dimension one, and maybe some that a dimension three, half or two, or something like that. They were basically integers. Were any of them by any chance dimension order one over n squared? Oh, no, no, not even close. This was a non interacting theory. So the excitations have to be governed by something that is very characteristic of the interactions. If you think about this as the ground state, you could perhaps model that as a free gas, as long as you have sort of particles enough. But the leading excitations are not going to be something that's going to be sort of of that nature. They are what a one over n squared. So think about it in terms of you making letters in quantum field theory, a phi, an x, a y, a z, whatever, division three, something like that. You have lots and lots of combinatorics for how many different ways there are to do it. That's lovely. But it's very clear that everything is going to be pretty much an integer. To get one over or one over n squared, you know, excitations above it is going to require some kind of interaction effect. We understand how that works in CFT2, it's called an orbifold, that we basically have highly wound orbifold sectors that have really low dimensions because they are very, very twisted. How to do that in integral force super mills, I don't have the giant, I have the slightest idea, but as I was going to say, well, I do have an idea. Giant gravitons. These are particular sectors of any before super young mills that seems to be very well designed. I mean, that has a gravity interpretation, but that also are particular good sectors of the any before super young mills that look to me promising for actually having the one over n squared excitations. So, can you say a work in progress about how you might try to attack this? I, it, 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 you're starting from a free field theory. So. Yep. So you think that there's a perturbative way of doing it? Well, that's actually very confusing yeah. because like the super gravity dual, like the classical gravitational thing should be dual to like yeah. highly non-free, yeah. like uh, large interactions, right? Yes. Like, uh, yeah, so, so, and then so just I, because you are supersymmetric, because it's PPS, and then it doesn't change with the coupling constant, no. then you can use some free three accounting. But if you're away from really the like purely the, yeah, the supersymmetric limit, like this argument, I hope I didn't give the impression that I thought it was easy. No, 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 yeah. no, not easy. So, but, like, but the reason that I that what seems promising to me is that if you reorganize just because you're also interested in the entropy itself, the free gas, and saying, well, actually, let me reorganize. There's a good way of reorganizing it, where instead of having basically order n squared ordinary operators, you organize them into uh, and but the problem with or, with ordinary operators is that when you take trace of a whole bunch of them and then trace of a whole bunch of others, they're not orthogonal. When when you have order n squared sitting inside the trace, your trace relations are crazy. So what you should do is to use a better basis. That better basis is to use sure functions where each character is of order n. So therefore, a little bit like in deep brains, it's a good idea to sort of do the one over g string first. So the anticipation here is instead of taking the n squared constituents, each with dimension one, you should take order n constituents, each with dimension n. Now, then when you do that, then the interaction between two blocks like that, one with dimension n, another with dimension n, there, if you just look at it sort of geographically by putting them in and using quiver theory for these things, you will see that, oh, this thing does not actually, is not complete. You must add orbital sectors to it. 
And then those orbital sectors have order one or n. So therefore, you can get the right numbers out of it. Is this exactly the right way of doing it? You know, it sounds like there are ongoing work, right? Yeah, but large and single trace operators in n equals four, and then like the one way in square, the, but, double trace, you have double trace operators. But the single trace, this is a very bad way, a very, very bad basis for looking at having order n, having order n squared inside your trace. Because clearly, look, you're going to have you're going to be completely dominated by trace relations, right? And we want operators of dimension. You're talking about how when I get up to operators that are pretty big. When you're saying double trace, you have in mind that oh, you mean dimension twelve or something, right? Big, not even order n. N squared. Oh no, no, you need a new language, right? And I'm saying order n though. I do have a language. It's called giant gravitons, and it's a different. Uh, basis in the language of, of you know, of, of super, any proposed superimals is a different basis of operators that in fact does automatically build in the two operators automatically having OPE that vanishes to the leading order just by the group theory. So that's a good start. Now you try to wonder what happens when you do one of the interaction corrections to this. And that's where I'd say that, well, actually, it looks, you know, very reasonable as if, in fact, these have a, these have a, Per representation literally as D strings that are self touching exactly capital N times. And the idea that that then basically make, means that I should allow for operators that are not single valued. So I should allow for operators that are like traces of N fields, except they violate periodicity conditions. They violate periodicity conditions with a phase that's order one over N. That's what you would have done in CFT2. And we're exploring whether that's the right answer in CFT4. And that was the end, as he's looking at the. Uh, yes. So, so that's what yeah. I heard. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So thanks for your attention. <laughs> Towards the end, you guys did wake up. You did get coffee. It was good. We did get coffee. <laughs> so in the, in the beginning, you, you gave a little hint about astrophysical yeah. objects. Uh, so, but what's the claim exactly on the? Or the hint, the I don't know, suspicion on astrophysical objects. Well, so this obviously is a limit. They're 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 limiting here where you have different limits. But in look, so actual astrophysical black holes is believed, at least by some estimates, that they are actually rather heavily peaked on very high rotation. They naturally suck in stuff and they rotate faster and faster. And in some poor approximation, you will say there's no end, and they will end up approximating. They would they will go infinitely fast or whatever, or you know go with the speed of light. A better approximation, which requires a lot more hydrodynamics, you know, plasma, whatever, than I would possibly understand. My understanding is that it's more like 0.99 or something like that. When you actually take into account real gases and blah, blah, blah. Is that 0 0.01 important? Let's suppose it's not. Then I would say that the actual black hole is on the verge of being able to spin out. That means that if you have anything trying to go in, it will bounce back. And people certainly are making models like this. And I mean, they're, they're respectable phenomenologists that are saying, what if there are axions that actually are dark matter that would sit in these halos around supermassive black holes? They would also bounce off it. And then they would be subject to super radiant instability. Of course, they would just bounce back out and become bigger. The key is, do they go back out again? Or do they get back in again? But that it has to be that it has to be a field of a type that is sort of stuck in a potential. Right. But dark matter could conceivably do that in that they, they're stuck near these big guys. So therefore, they cannot get infinitely far away. So therefore, you can, in fact, get a resonance where you get huge dark matter signals. How realistic is this? I'm not a phenomenologist. But I know that they, 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 they get published papers that seem to get cited and talked about. So that's as far as I'm willing to go to say that this is not... That's the edge relation between super radians and astrophysical black holes, that if there are really light scalars in the actual world, these effects would seem to be, could be relevant. Right? But it requires very large, uh, very light black uh, scalars for, for it to be the case. And a few other things kind of align with, so how exactly extreme do these guys get? Right? But, the idea is basically that, oh, but how much, how much of the full mass of the black hole will end up with the axions? And the idea is it's a finite percentage, a finite percentage. It's big. Right? 
is a lot of energy, and it and there's a finer percentage of it that gets out. You know, it doesn't it's not a real bomb? It doesn't go to zero, but a finer percentage of it gets out. So it's 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 huge. It's a huge amount of energy, and that's possibly as a result. Oh, since it's late, maybe uh, we should uh, leave the questions to private and to thank uh, Ben again. Yeah.